working in the world cannot really capture the full story of the birth of Jesus Christ. It was such a momentous occasion. Tonight, <clears throat> there will be a musical presentation where the story will be told through recitation and music here. And we invite you to join with us as we continue to celebrate the glorious birth of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I've been uh, reading Advent uh, devotionals, and the one that I, I've uh, picked up on was written by some of the faculty at Evangel College. And most of them are about waiting because there was hundreds of years that the Jews were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And then finally it happened. And what a glorious day it was. He's coming back again. We believe that is soon. And we look forward to the second coming of Christ. This morning, I just want to take one scripture, Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Uh, the uh, experts tell me that's the only place in the scriptures, in the New Testament, that these terms about Christ Jesus are brought together in the same place, in the same scripture. He's the Savior. He's Christ. He is the Lord. And I've been uh, thinking, I think the, uh, the, the songwriters have captured in many ways much more than we have the spirit and story of Christmas. For instance, joy to the world, the Lord has come. And I was thinking that if I were able to go to every continent, every city, if I was able to walk every inch of the terrain of this earth, everywhere my foot would land, the message is for them. God loves the world, so love the world, and joy to the world. As the song goes, what? The Lord is come. And that's the source of true joy when we recognize how significant Bethlehem is. God taking a human body, it's called the incarnation, and living for 33 years among us and revealing himself to us. And so I, I believe I believe we've lost the significance. We've not seen the grandeur nor the scope of this message because we've been so caught up with the tinsel of the, of the time and all the uh, trappings that have been added to it. And I enjoy exchanging gifts, but let's never forget whose birth we celebrate. And let's keep him in the in the forefront and keep the focus on Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, and He has come. And it's a good news mission that God sent forth His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And the word Savior here. And the word Jesus come from the same root word, I'm told. And it means to deliver. It means to set free. In the Old Testament, to save was to lead into a large, unconfined area. It was to eliminate the restraints. It was to expand the horizons. It was to increase the life. And I found that true whether you're reading Old Testament or New Testament, when you know Christ as your Savior and Lord. And I find that throughout the Scriptures. John uses the term. Peter uses the term. Mark or Paul uses the term Savior and Lord. And sometimes we lose, fa lose uh, sight of the fact Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Amen. And that ought to be the confession of the church today. Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. 
And it's a wonderful thing to realize what God has done for us in Bethlehem's manger. We want to look at the Savior. The Savior, first of all, is a powerful Savior. Not just a temporal Savior. In the Old Testament, in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 27, the Bible says that God gave uh, uh, them into their enemies, into the hands of their enemies, who made them suffer. And in time of their suffering, they cried out to you. You heard them from heaven. According to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemy. And so victory at war, when the enemy was defeated, that was considered salvation, a savior. That was a deliverance that had taken place. And of course, the prevailing attitude when Christ was born is he is going to lead the revolution against the Romans who have occupied and are ruling the world. And he would save us from it, deliver us from that. But if you read on in Nehemiah 28, it says, after they had rest of their enemies, but after they, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies, and you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does, then them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and a stiffened their neck, and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. You see, these leaders, these saviors of the Old Testament, we look at them in a temporal matter. It was temporary. The victories didn't last because the real issue cannot be dealt with by human beings. The real need of a savior is someone to save people from their sins. I've read this, this book and I've just about finished it for the umpteenth time. But when I read the Old Testament about Israel, God delivers them. Things go well. They're blessed. They fall right back into their idolatrous practices. I remember reading recently, it says that though God had done, given them great victory, they didn't destroy certain altars in their land. And these were altars to other gods. And what did they do? They bowed down, and eventually they fell into uh, bondage again, and that is repeated over and over and over because the sin issue was not dealt with. What the need is for a spiritual deliverer. They needed someone more. The chief need, save from sin itself. Forgiveness of sin, a transformed heart, restoration to righteous living. That's still the greatest need today. Have you ever seen a day like this day? I've never read so many people coming out of the woodwork to make accusations against others. And you don't know who to believe and who not to believe. And it is, it is, it is, uh, it's, it's foolish. What we're seeing as we wash our dirty laundry in the, in the public sector, many things the Bible says are shame to even talk about them in mixed company. They should be dealt with in the proper manner and not used as a tool for or against. And we see things happening. We see sin gaining its control. Though God has blessed America, we are a blessed people. You and I enjoy that blessing. 
But what we find is sin abounds today and is reaching limits that we've never seen in our lifetime. And it's not over yet. The great need of this country is a Savior who delivers them from sin and delivers people from the power of sin. Jesus is the perfect Savior. He saves from sin. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, the angel said to Mary and to Joseph, You will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, he is distinctively the Savior. And when it talks about uh, Jesus, he is a spiritual deliverer. And he came to set men free from that bondage from within. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, it says he, he became perfect. He was made perfect. And that has always been a mystery to me, that how can you perfect that which is perfect? Jesus Christ never sinned, and so we know he was perfect. But it says in verse 9, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Being made perfect. What is he talking about? He became the perfect Savior. And in order for that to happen, the, first, the Scripture above says, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, Jesus was never disobedient. But when the Father's will was for him to die on the cross, he was obedient to the Father. And he saw the cost of living out and obeying his Father to the nth degree. And he had to become man. He had to live as we live. He had to come down and identify with us. And in order to become the Savior that we so desperately needed. And thank God, Jesus is come. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. And that's the reason we rejoice today. He's come to deliver us from the bondage of sin. And from the power of sin in our life. And so he is the distinctively the Savior. And not only is he perfect, but he's also personal. The Bible says, unto you he is born. Unto you he has come. And that's to the, to the shepherds. And he says it to you and to I today. Unto you I have come. It's a personal thing. Salvation is a personal issue. Salvation is personal for every person that comes to Christ. If 50 people were saved in this service today, each one of them would individually, personally, have a relationship and an encounter with Jesus Christ. You can't get into heaven on your parents' coattail. They may be the best Christians coming, but that'll never work when Jesus returns. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit in order to enter heaven. And if you don't have that new birth, I won't talk much about the other place, but the Bible says where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. There's no death there. But there's no God there. And that's hell when you're separated for eternity from God. From all that is good. And evil reigns supreme. That's hell. And the, the punishment is forever and ever. Jesus saves us from all of that. And the scripture says, Whosoever will may come. In fact, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, the Bible says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth <clears throat> say, Come. 
And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Let me tell you, if you're not a believer today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, the Bible makes it plain. Why? Because God made us free and gave us a free will. And will never violate that free will. He will never force you to serve Him. He invites you to come. The Spirit says come. The church says come. The Lord says come. Come, whosoever will. The reason that people do not come to Christ. First of all, they may be blinded, but when they see the truth, if they do not will to receive Him, they will not receive Him. Because your will, you must be willing. He will never force His way into your life. He comes and knocks, but you must open the door. And so it's a terrible thing. <clears throat> the further you go in life without Christ, the more, the stronger your will becomes. Until if you're not careful, you have no desire to ever know Christ in a real way. And you're comfortable. You'll take your chances. I've heard people say that. I'll take my chances. You don't have a chance without Jesus Christ. Amen? Christ has come. The Bible says, and you know what Christ means? And I don't have time to really deal with that today, but I, I will perhaps Wednesday night. But Christ means anointed one. It's the Old Testament Messiah, which means anointed one. And that it talks about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I read uh, one man said that anointing in the Old Testament, prophet, priest, and king, and especially the king was considered the Lord's anointed. And the priest was anointed with oil. But prophet, priest, and, and, and king, they were anointed with oil. What does it mean? Consecrated to a particular uh, mission in life. For the king to rule, he was anointed. And that meant along with the pouring on of that oil that God gave gifts and abilities that he would not normally have that would enable him to rule and to do what he has been charged to do. And this morning, when Christ is called the anointed, Jesus is called the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, it means that he is consecrated, set apart for this purpose, to save every single person who comes to him. He will not turn one away, the Bible says. If any man comes to me, I will not turn him away, because he's come to seek and to save that which is lost. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was to become, be saved, be born again. Happened to me when I was about 18 and a half years of age. After attending church all my life, you know, church cannot save you. Religion cannot save you. Jesus saves. I love that song. I, you, we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And our goal is God's goal. It's not just to see America hear the voice again and hear the message again, but to let the world hear today. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He breaks that inner power of sin and evil and sets us free to live for God. Amen. He puts our feet on the right path. And it's a wonderful thing. He is, and I, I just want to mention that part about the anointing. It's a consecration. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up in steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. 
Draw me nearer, Lord, nearer, blessed Lord. That's the cry of our hearts. But we, we know that we are bent toward him. He's personal. He is powerful. He is the perfect Savior today. There's, the story is told of a group of people in the Sandwich Islands who were smitten by leprosy. And you know, for years I used to hear missionaries and see pictures of people who had fingers had dropped off. They just rotted right on the hand and dropped off. Eventually it killed them. And so the, the decision was made to take one of those islands and put everybody on that island that had leprosy. They could never come off. They were there until they died. There was a priest standing on the, on the shore as they were loading the people on to take them over to the island for, to, to die when the disease had run its course. And the priest said to them, there's no one to shepherd them. There's no one to watch over them. Let me go. I'll go with them. And knowing that once he got on the boat to go over and live with those lepers, he would never be able to come back again, lest he would infect others with the disease. And after many years of ministering there with the, the lepers and no doubt conducting funerals, when, when it ran its course and the people had passed away, he contracted leprosy. And he wrote back a cheerful message about how he had been enabled to serve and to share Christ with these lepers. And many of them had come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. And now he said, my days are numbered. And uh, there was not a bit of sorrow. There was no regret in his life because he manifested exactly the Spirit of Jesus Christ, when he came to Bethlehem's manger. Leprosy is a type of sin. There's no cure for it, humanly speaking. There's only one physician that can heal it, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus came and lived among us. I can't imagine what that was like. Coming from heaven's noonday into a darkened world, rebellious, filled with hatred and bitterness and violence, and rubbing shoulders with people who were not like angels and who didn't regard him with favor at all. And yet Christ came and never one time, never one time, did he critis be critical of what he was doing? He marched right up to Calvary's cross to pay the price for our sins so that we could be forgiven. That's the spirit of Jesus. That's what Christ has done for you. That's why the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good. We've all sinned. We've come short of God's glory. But God in His infinite grace has given His Son that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. When we stand before God, He won't be asking us about our business. How well did we do? The question will be, what have you done with Jesus Christ? Has Jesus been your Savior and Lord? Have you lived for Him? Have you been a witness for Him? Because it's just like as we were singing the song, I couldn't help but think. We were singing about everyone hearing, and I'm thinking there's only one way everybody's going to hear. And that is if we become his witness. We begin to share with others the splendor of the coming of Christ Jesus 
Did you know there's no other religion where the God that is worshipped actually made the sacrifice for their forgiveness? Every other religion, they're working to make their way in. I read this week that in England, I believe it was, there was a joint service between Muslims and Christians. And in that service, they read from the Koran a passage of Scripture that says that Christ is not God. It's a great man, great prophet, but he's not the least, last. He's not God. There's all, this is not a religion. It is a relationship with our Creator. And there's only one God, true God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we bow before Him. Can you imagine the shepherds, when they, the uh, wise men, when they were following that star, knowing they were going to see a great king? And the star took them to a very common house. And when they walked into that room, they saw a baby lying there, meager means. He humbled himself so that I, a mill worker's son, could know him in a personal manner. I have access to him access to God. And today, my challenge is this. Let's not lose sight of the whole, real, the whole issue. It's a sin issue. And God has provided the perfect sacrifice for our forgiveness. But you and I have, that, have the process of saying, yes, I believe. And not just saying it with our mouth, but saying it with our life. And we begin to move towards God and show a world Christ by the way we live. We're in it, but we're not of the world. Our life is very different from the life of the world. And that should be a good difference. We're here to show God's great love and His power. Would you bow with me this morning? The Lord Jesus Christ has commissioned us to go into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature. If we can't go, then it falls our place and our privilege to send someone else. What a joy that is to be able to send someone with the greatest message on earth. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. It's a wonderful thing. The tragedy would be for you and I in America, as much gospel as we are exposed to, if we're interested at all, it's there, that we would live and die and not know Christ as Savior and Lord. Does it enhance your life? I have found it greatly enhances life. Is it an easy life? Not necessarily. But it's a fulfilling life. And you can come down to the end of your journey and know, I have accomplished what God placed me here to do. And that's my goal. I want to be one who finishes what the Lord has given him to do. God wants you to be a part of his family. He's ready if you're willing the will is a, terrible, is a terribly strong force in us. It's like the little boy. The parents made him sit down. He said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but on the inside I'm still standing up. We're willful people. We have strong wills. And that will must be, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. I will accept your invitation this morning. I will. And I would like to pray with you right where you are and lead you in a prayer along with others that will join with us. Pastor, I don't know Christ personally. I want to know him today. Please remember me in this prayer. 
I just want you to know, I want to know Christ this morning. Would you just slip your hand up? I'm not asking you to become assemblies of God. I'm asking you to come to Christ. I need the Lord this morning. Something missing in my life. I need Jesus, and that's the missing element. Would you slip it high? Pastor, I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I want Christ this morning. I want Christ this morning in my life. If you're old enough to know good from evil, you're old enough to be responsible for what decisions you make. I need the Lord today. We're going to sing a couple of songs as we close out this service. It's an opportunity to respond to God's Word to us. We want to respond. Everybody should respond in some way. If you sense a need this morning, if you will slip out and come, you, this altar's open. This is a good time just to bend the knee. It's a good thing to do, just to bow before God. Lord, I humble myself. I submit myself to you afresh and anew. It's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing business of staying submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his will. And this morning, I'm giving you the invitation to come. I'm going to ask our leaders, our board members, staff members, to be present here at the front, just to come and stand here. And if you want someone to pray with you, we still have a few minutes before we close our service. We're here for you. If you need prayer for sickness, you, you're fighting a battle, if you'll stand right in the center section here, we'll anoint you with oil and pray for you this morning for your healing. The door is open today. We invite you to come. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. If you will to do it, you can come. God will meet you. I'm telling you, he will meet you. Once you know him personally, there's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. Knowing Christ in a personal manner. You can be seated or you can stand, whatever. We're going to lead you in some, some, uh, some Christmas music, but the bottom line is when we come to worship him, amen? We come to trust him as our Savior and our Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray now, I pray that your Holy Spirit will draw people unto yourself. May we not stand back from pride or any of those issues, but may we do that which you have called us to do, Lord. May we be about the business that you have called us to be about, I pray. I bless you today. I give you glory today, Lord. I give you honor this morning. You are great and greatly to be praised. Praise God. Praise God. If you want to stand, you can. If you want to sit, you can. But let's join together in a response to God for what he has done for us. Let's sing together and make it from our heart. Bless you.
Amen, 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 amen. I don't want my mast half up. I don't want to be creeping through something. I want to be rejoicing, amen. Let's give God glory this morning. Let's give him praise today, hallelujah. Glory and honor, praise and power be unto Jesus our Lord. No other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. 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 I guarantee you, when I got saved, being a church person and thinking I knew everything, when I walked out of church that night, I was a different person. And I didn't feel like just mealy-mouthing it. I felt like shouting to the top of my lungs. He saves, hallelujah, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. We have enough proper Christians. When we get to heaven, they're going to have to be at the back of the line because it's going to be so noisy, they won't be able to stand it. In fact, the Bible says it's like thunder peals. People around the throne worshiping and magnifying and glorifying the Lord and praising Him. I was lost. Now I'm found. I was blind. Now I see. Do you mind if I'm excited about it? Do you mind if I shout a little bit about it? He saved me and He kept me saved all the years. In fact, I was thinking in the wee hours of the morning when I woke up, and I don't know why, but 50 years ago, in June 1967, in a Sunday night service that was nothing unusual, except God spoke to me and called me into the ministry. Did you know it was two months I was moving to Lakeland to prepare? I didn't wait any longer. I knew 
that I knew, that I knew that God has spoken to my heart. And I was thinking last night as I lay there on the bed, 50 years have passed since Betty and I struck out with our two little ones. Kenny was about five, six years of age. And I'd never been to Florida in my life. We, we left our family. I always said I'd never do that for a job, but I'd do it for the Lord. And I look back over those years, and i just counting them out. Fifty years ago, I said yes to God. And about three o'clock this morning, I was lifting my hands and saying, Lord, it's still yes. It's still yes. It's still yes. You are still Lord. I'm glad I said yes to you. No regrets. Now I'm looking forward to standing there when we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not to see if we're going to heaven, but to see if we earned any reward. I'm glad I can be able to say, Lord, I haven't always been what I should have been. I haven't always done everything I should have done. But you have kept me all this time. I'm so glad I said yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we're still saying yes today. Because he, don't, he doesn't just save you. He keeps you. He keeps you saved. It's better today than it was when I started. It's better now than it was the night he lifted that terrible burden off of my life of guilt and rebellion and hatred and all the stuff that goes with it. In a moment, God just said, you don't need this anymore. I actually walked free of it when I left. We have a term when somebody gets a little high, they're stepping high. I was a little high in Jesus and I was stepping high. I walked out of that room tonight and I said, now, Lord, my life has been completed here. I know that I know that you are real. I've met you today, and I'll never be able to doubt that you exist. I couldn't anyway, because I'd seen him in my family. I saw him in my family. Miracles. God has always been with us. What a joy. This morning, I just wished I could put some of this infection I've got in me in you. I would like to put this fire in you if I could. Every one of us should be. We should be so fired up. Instead of trying to build you up and get you up, we should be trying to pull you down and say, okay, let's keep it orderly now. But I've been here 35 years and I've never had one or two cases where I needed to say, let's keep it orderly. God's looking for some excited people who love him and are ready to serve him. Amen. Life is too short to waste it, friend. And no other success can take the place of your success in serving God and doing what God has called you to do. Thank you for coming today. I guess the offering wasn't that great. But I didn't give you the hour job anyway, right? Thank you so much. Next Sunday morning, just a service, 10.05. 10 and uh, we will meet here for our Christmas Eve service and communion service. And I, will, I hope everybody that can, and I hope you'll bring some guests with you. And uh, we will worship him, talk about Jesus, and celebrate what he has done for us and then remember his death and his resurrection hallelujah god is good thank you father go with us we pray keep your hand upon us and let us be a light in a dark place i pray the world is dark but you're full of light and we thank you for indwelling us and lighting us like a a lamp lord shine wherever you place us. Make this a great day and tonight we pray special blessing upon the music and the presentation in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.